Hello and welcome to another exciting lesson. Uh, today we are going to tap into the volumetric effects, something that everyone dreads at some stage, but everyone would also like to use in their uh, creative work. Today we'll solve this puzzle once and for all. In fact, uh, we have already talked a little bit about volumetrics in this training. We have, after all, gone into volumetric parameter settings, so you know what they are about. Nevertheless, today we are going to enter volumetrics at a slightly deeper level. We are going to use it in a creative and imaginative ways. Volumetric effects will be another tool helping us to change the way we think about composition, just by the sheer fact that light behaves differently. There will be an opportunity to reprogram ourselves and learn more skills as an artist. Lots of exciting stuff ahead of us in this final segment in the next four practical lessons. Today we plan uh, to complete a very spectacular scenario popularly known as God's Race, which uh, looks about like this. It's going to be a really trivial job if you know what to set where, so let's get going. So what are volumetric effects? First. Maybe let's start with the basics. In general, volumetric effects is just a fancy way of saying fog, mist, smoke, aerial perspective, and all these effects are created when there's something floating in the air. It could be dust, water particles, or some kind of air pollution. We mentioned this in the lesson on memory colors. The more of something in the air, the more of a volumetric effect and the kind of dense volumetric you see in the forest photography is a lot of water particles floating around. In films, it's, for example, some water vapor with dust or other stuff. When you use a flashlight in those conditions, the light interacts with all that stuff in the air and it just gets softened and dispersed. Whatever the volumetric effect, vapor, mist or a massive fog, it tends to be very attractive. See, like examples like this, we've got some renderings with powerful volumetric effects. It truly looks epic, and it's not that hard at all, but we'll get into that shortly. Moving on, what do volumetric gives you? Volumetric effects are a bit of a press play to win, honestly. They build emotions very quickly, and these are pretty extreme emotions often dramatic with greater than life feeling. It's not something we interact with on a daily basis. As soon as we see fog outside the window, we feel an inner anxiety or excitement somewhere and immediately turn to the nearest person and share that feeling, you know. Well, unless you live somewhere in a rainy mountains or in fjords, then you might get used to it more. But anyway, it is hard as a human being to feel completely indifferent being in such a climate. This is why people in various industries often use these effects to attract attention very quickly. Filmmakers use volumetric effects on a massive scale, using large or small smoke machines and blowing smoke all over interiors or forests. You can even find smoke in toy commercials just to make them a little bit more epic. Concept artists often use this to be able to skip less important details, focus on silhouettes and also very quickly relate to a particular atmosphere. In the game art, fog also happens to be a must and may help with drawing distance limitations. Photographers sometimes use a smoke for studio shots or hunt for outstanding natural conditions when trying to capture spectacular landscapes. Of course, 3D artists love to use them too. We truly love them. And now, it might seem that with any volumetric effects, whether it's an aerial perspective, whether it's some kind of smoke or fog, uh, it's about reducing the visibility of objects. Well, and there may be some truth in that, but you can think about it a little bit more broadly. You have to be aware that with the introduction of volumetric effects, there are a couple of things going on. 
we have applied the aerial perspective to absolutely every scenario. So the very fact of its existence adds a certain realism to the scene. Our primary goal was to achieve a readable depth, improving our composition. But you can also think about it a little differently. First of all, obscured objects lose the impression of detail. Under the layer of fog, we are not able to see super detailed materials anymore. Obviously, you can use this fact to your advantage. Sometimes, material can be super basic when you work with volumetric effects. If you have a city panorama far away, it can be a simple clay material. The fog will cover that to a large extent, and that's how it will play. And that's perfectly okay because that's not what these scenarios are entirely about. It's not about fighting over every detail, as we have done so far, but it's more about the sheer silhouette of the architecture, the environment and how everything works as a whole. We talk about this in the second lesson on contrast, and in these scenarios, the strong and bold compositions that concept artists often struggle for will be very helpful. During the foggy conditions, you can think not so much about what to hide, but what to actually leave visible. Through the fog, the whole geometric core of our composition resonates even more, and we can almost see in black and white where the layers in the scene are outlined, what are actually the strongest lines and forms. We'll show what it really means in practice, but right away we encourage you to be inspired by what awaits uh, you in this final segment. Just as in the night and the overcast, we had a slight shift in mindset as we were deprived of the sun. Uh, it is here with the volumetric effects that there will be another opportunity to reprogram. And the magic will be that the space will be our canvas not just the object that the light falls on, not just the tree and the ground and the architecture, but everything around. Every area where the air just floats. Just look at this example. We have a single frame from a movie. On the left, we have the light source and light is falling on the object, while the space between them is empty. But when you look at the second frame, we have space filled with some volumetrics, smoke or whatever. And the space itself starts to be kind of an actor in the scene. We can scatter color in it and build very dramatic compositions. So that will be another compositional tool. We will have more areas of the picture to introduce compositional interventions. Space will be the medium that carries the light and it will become a tool that builds and redefines the composition in another way. You'll see what we mean in a moment. Okay, it's time to move on to practice. Today we are going back to the basics and explaining everything about Corona volume material, starting from the distance, scattering and all that stuff, but most importantly, directionality, which may be a little less intuitive. This will be quite a specific lesson because theory and practice will be a bit intertwined, or at least more so than before. This will be a bit of a free-flowing lesson and there will be a degree of, you know, uh, creative freedom. Though uh, the scenario we are aiming for is another sunset, but with elements of god rays this time, rather a monochromatic mood, which always looks nice. In the end, we'll uh, summarize the parameters we ultimately landed with, so you won't have to look for any settings in the middle of the lesson. We are going to use Corona Sun and Sky here, so we are throwing the system into our scene as we always do. We plug in Corona Sky, switch to low poly assets and immediately start interactive rendering here. There is no need to wait for anything. Here, in tone mapping, we have all default settings and we won't be changing anything in this lesson. 
of course, except for the exposure, but it's about to change dramatically anyway as we start introducing fog. Okay, we already did it a few times, so let's create the Corona volume material here. And here we can immediately drag it into the global volume material slot. We'll rather do this lesson in the global. We drag it out, and for the time being, let's land with some settings like this, so that we can at least see anything. As far as the Corona volumetric material is concerned, it is generally the only and also completely sufficient volumetric shader to use in Corona Renderer. It's the most basic medium for creating everything from smoke, haze, fog to even clouds. And we mentioned earlier that we can apply this volumetric either globally or locally. As we have tested this many times in various ways in the past lessons. As I mentioned, we'll do it globally now, and in the next two lessons we'll either take another approach or combine both. So, as a reminder, you'll be able to see again how it works. We need to warn you straight away that the volumetrics has a way of being terribly slow. Well, maybe not that terribly, but in order to achieve a certain precision of rendering, well, we have to wait a bit. That's why we'll first show you more or less what it's all about in interactive, and then we'll show you the production images to see everything in fully rendered detail. So we finally got to all those volumetric options here in the Corona volume material. And certainly we've already learned some bits in the past lessons, but now we'll go thoroughly through them step by step, starting with the first one, absorption. So in general, Absorption, as you should already know, determines how dense our fog is. And we can control absorption in two ways. The first way is the color, and by default we always had it mid-gray, but in general we can control it within this black to white spectrum. A darker color is a denser fog, while a lighter color is a thinner fog. And the white is virtually no fog at all. The other way to control this is with the numerical value. And basically Corona uses both color and numerical input to determine what a fog looks like. So for example, if we give a lighter color but smaller numerical value, we might end up with a similar result. On the other hand, we have always had the color here set to this default mid-gray, just for simplicity sake and we advise doing it this way. The use of color makes sense when we are using some additional maps and you will actually see how this works in the next lesson. You can plug in some noise or corona distance map, but uh, more on that later. We are making a uniform looking fog in this scenario and it's just easier to narrow this down to just one value instead of controlling two. And that will be everything that is important about absorption. Basically, it's such a self-explanatory parameter. Then we come to scattering, and this parameter affects two things, color and directionality. The color is, of course, the tint of the fog that we have in the scene. Yes, we can just give to this fog, or rather to the light that comes through this fog, a particular tint. And in fact, it's basically the resultant of the color of the light source, as well as what we have set here. Let's look at a case like this, that here in the sun, instead of this realistic value, we set a direct color, just like we did in the sunset scenario, to increase the perceived warmth of the sunlight. And well, we have the impression that this fog is so intensely orange, which of course is related to the fact that the light source has such a tint. If, for example, we now give a bluish tint to the scattering color,
the resultant appearance will be much grayer because these are more or less complementary colors and they cancel each other. What's more, they can also cause some unwanted color shift and we saw this in our lesson on nighttime lighting, where simply the bluish fog and warm artificial lights caused some magenta to appear in the scene. So the color of the fog is the combination of these two color inputs. And in general, we have a number of possibilities here to change this color. For example, to add an orange-yellowish impression that will add up to the already warm illumination. You need to be careful with this saturation, because it's easy to overdo it and create something highly stylized in appearance. On the other hand, even a low saturation will produce quite a colorful effect, so there is no need to go crazy here. Yeah, it can be useful, but we will rather stick close to the middle grays. We can add just a hint of warm saturation. Maybe that's even too much. In addition to this, color scattering can also be mapped. We can make this color heterogeneous, driven by a gradient or a noise. And this is not an option we use often, but it can be utilized to boost the feeling of intricacy and extra detail, extra nuance of the volumetric object, to bring on some turbulent characteristics of the smoke. For now, we will leave it as it is in the global fog conditions. It's not something that will usually bother us. Okay, so we are approaching our directionality value, but maybe before getting deeper into it, we will discuss this single bounce only option. Turning this option on or off doesn't seem to change too much now, but in the next lessons we will get to objects where this can be quite critical. And we used this option in the second overcast, when we needed to make soft shadows, then don't consume too much memory to compute. As for this kind of simple uniform volumetrics we've had so far, we can always have this switched on. The fog will just be a little bit more realistic and leaving this option on won't cost too much of our CPU's processing power. This is likely to happen in other situations though, and we'll talk about that later, when we get to VDB objects. As for now, we are moving on to the elephant in the room, which is our directionality value. Maybe I will light this scene a little differently, so as to explain it better. Let's move our sun so as to have it visible somewhere here, at the back of the scene. almost perfectly against the camera. I might have darkened this scene a bit, and okay, something like this. So yes, the directionality parameter itself is basically one numerical slider. It can take a minimum value of minus 0 0.99 and a maximum value of 0 0.99. And we can already see that something is changing here, but we'll get to that in a moment. In general, the directionality parameter will interestingly be very dependent on what the position of the camera is, and what the position and direction of the light in the scene is. The same directionality settings will give a totally different effect if the sun is at the front, or at the back, or at the side, and you're about to see that. We will first consider the case we have now and that's the sun in the very back of the scene. And this will simply be the most common case for using directionality parameter, which we generally encourage everyone to do. That is, we have this light visible in the back of the scene, just as we saw before, that the sun is somewhere here. It looks too bright now, but let's remember that it used to be somewhere here. And now, these directionality values increase or change the direction of the light scattering, just a little bit. 
So as we go up with these values a little bit like this, we can see as if this fog gets more intense, although it is somewhat of an illusion. Perceptually, however, my impression is that the fog is more profound now. There is more luminosity and such an epic dimension to this image. And we can go back even higher. Then we start to notice that it's not so much that it somehow increases, but that it just becomes a very heterogeneous. Suddenly, here, somewhere in this forest, there is less of it, less luminosity visible. And this is where it increases. It becomes quite non-uniform across the frame, in homogeneous, so as we get closer to these upper values and this glow gets compressed, it tightens up to where we have our light source. Whereas if we give minus values, that glow sort of disappears. It's a bit like we don't have any fog at all. And in fact, it starts to get a bit weird like that. It's a bit dark and the fog is a bit weaker and it's not entirely clear what to think about it, but we'll explain it in a moment. Generally, the rule of thumb is not to go with the value above 0 0.9 and below minus 0 0.9. Because firstly, it calculates for a very long time. And secondly, the scattered light gets so much packed around the light source that it just rarely looks good. And this volumetric impression is just very weird. Okay, so that's how it looks and behaves if we have the light somewhere here at the back of the scene. But let's see what happens if we move it so we have it practically perfectly from the side. And now we have a value of 0.0. .0. Let's see what happens when we change this value. 0 0.3, 0 0.6, Point 0.9 We can see that things are changing a bit here. Now there is a general feeling as if this volumetric material barely existed. It has become darker. It's also maybe slightly hazy here, but compared to that it's also become somehow clearer. And what will it look like when we have the negative value, for example? And that's, surprisingly, a very similar effect. Also, this impression of fog is much smaller. Let's compare again the extreme values. Minimal one. And something is happening here. And the maximal one makes it sort of disappear. And how do you explain it all? What is happening here? That is, there is actually a tiny difference between the minimum and maximum values, but there is one, even though we can see the light source and this scattering effect within it. This is where directionality can affect how the rays are scattered in areas where the sun is very strongly reflected. If the sun ray falls on some plane and wants to reflect of it, Directionality can boost or inhibit this direction of reflection, depending on this input value. Yes, and that's why this behavior might appear somewhat strange. And we'll come back to this on the finished renderings, when I feel it will be easier to spot all of it. But for the time being, just remember that if you have the main light source on the side, Directionality simply won't do you much good. It might just confuse you a bit and complicate your work. So that was it as far as this directionality from the side is concerned. Let's see now what happens when we have light completely from behind the camera, in the very front of our scene. And this is where directionality is going to be totally funky in general. So negative values, let's see what they are going to do what's happening here in general. And the negative values will give the impression of more intense fog, but you can see that this fog is 
kind of close to the objects. And again, it's a matter of reflectivity and boosting that reflectivity, which at these extreme values gives completely funky results. Generally, it's so-called forward and backward scattering effect, but we'll just throw that word around, because translating that at all in detail can give you an unnecessary headache. However, we have already mentioned that directionality can be treated in terms of the relations between directly visible and reflected light. Here, if we increase this parameter, we reduce this effect of focused scattering. We can see that this concentration is spilling over to us. At zero values, we have a completely natural fog. And with positive values, not too much happens, except that this impression of fog seems to decrease. And we are about to go over this again and see in the final rendered images so as to be able to spot a bit more detail. So uh, here we can go back to zero with this and basically stop this rendering. Like we said, this case, when the light is on the side or the back is funky, it's a little bit to make you aware that this positioning of the lights has an effect on the volumetrics. So, to sum it up, camera position, lighting positions and directionality are very much combined. You may choose to change the camera position and the volumetric effects simply won't work anymore. So, every time you change the camera, you should revisit the directionality parameter. Sometimes you may also go with negative values, but usually that doesn't happen in production, so we won't get into that too much. Keep in mind, and that's the most important thing, to have the lighting source coming from the back, and then you should easily work it out. Here we have a juxtaposition of these different values, and we have different directionality values shown here, while their density stays the same. I think it's a value of uh, 12,000 centimeters. And in this example, we are using HDRI just to make it clear that it behaves the same with all lighting systems. And so as you can see if the sky details are visible or not. Okay, so what can we actually tell from all of these? Firstly, here we have the negative directionality values and as I said, they are not very useful here. They make things in the scene appear completely extreme. On one hand, we can even see clearly blue skies and it's generally super dark here. And on the other hand, this impression of some kind of fog is really concentrated around our light source. Negative values make it also completely unpleasant, unintuitive, and we may really not know what is happening and what to do about it at all. So it is unlikely to be of any use to us at all, but we can simply realize that such values can be assigned to this and the results will be what they will be. Okay, so now we can see here what happens with positive values. And as we can see, the difference between these mountains and the sky is smaller, everything gets brightened up, and these details somewhere in the sky slowly fade away. Secondly, we have the increased impression of the luminosity of those god rays, which, yes, there were here too at this value of zero, 00, but now, thanks to the altered luminosity, we have the impression that these shadows are so much more flashy and pronounced. We can see the value of 0 0.6 here, for which we have various other comparisons. This fog seems to pour more into the over image layers here too. In addition, this also has an interesting compositional effect because suddenly we are able to read these layers much better as some separate elements. You know, we see that we distinguish very clearly where the sky is, where the mountains are, where the edge here is and where the next edge is. Suddenly that detail gets lost somewhere and we are basically left with this kind of basic massing of that image. And it's usually very attractive when we do lighting like this. Let's see what happens at values of 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. We can see that the luminosity here 
in general is almost 100%. And suddenly here, it starts to get darker. The wall of the house is almost droning in black. At the maximum values, we have a similar situation to what we had at minus 0.99, which is that we have this luminosity concentrated here, and the scene is quite dark. I mean, it's not identical, but it's also not that useful for us. And in our work, we mostly land with this directionality somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7, I think. And for the 0.6, I did some more tests where we also test different densities, where we have this fog even more intense, and we see how it influences the readability of all these elements in the scene. It is true that here, somewhere in the background, the brightness difference between the sky and the mountains become less pronounced, but we still have a glow that emphasizes this. The clarity of the depth of the scene is very high here. On the other hand, if we make the fog thinner, we obviously arrive at a more or less completely neutral impression. We also have a few images like this, where you can compare different directionalities at uh, 0 0.0 and 0 0.6. With the same density values and zero directionality, the perception of the scene is completely different. In the first image, we still see the clouds, which is slightly strange. Additionally, it took a lot of time to render. Initially, the fog was very dense and dark, so we needed to adjust the exposure. With values of 3000 cm, we can see that it already looks better. Finally, the sky looks better in relation to the mountains, and how we can generally read the depth. But still, directionality of 0.6 improves our perception of the scene. And here, of course, as this fog is weaker, we also have differences but they are not so pronounced. Sometimes with the zero directionality, we just have the impression of a tinted air rather than a flashy fog. Okay, so we can, I think, return to our scene, switch on the interactive, and move on to continue discussing volumetric material after this long digression. So we are kind of left with the third parameter here, which is the emission. And emission causes everything within our volume to start emitting light, causing a certain glowing effect. Here we have a color and we have distance value. And let's give an example of a color here. Distance works in a similar way to absorption distance. The smaller it is, the more intense the effect. If you give distance of 100 cm, you will see practically nothing but color, and the larger value makes the effect weaker. Okay, we sort of get such a glowing effect here, but in such a scenario where the fog is globally uniform, it doesn't make much sense we get, so to speak, such a generic color cast that emits light, but apart from the longer rendering time, it doesn't particularly bring anything to the table. This effect will be relevant and applicable to making all kinds of fire explosions and so on. We'll talk more about this in the next lessons. It can be also useful for tricks, for example, to make some kind of aura effect with which we take advantage of the fact that we can plug in a map here and we can combine it with other maps. That is, for example, we can limit the fog only to the area around the object with absorption map and give emission to it. Then there will be a kind of luminous aura around that object, but we won't generally explore this parameter specifically for our need. In architectural visualization, it is not particularly necessary. Okay, so that was the third parameter. By the way, if you are in doubt, you can always hover your mouse over a parameter and you'll get a tooltip that explains how it works. It is there, so you can always use it to help yourself. Okay, and then 
there is the volume mapping option, which we'll be covering in two lessons from now when we'll do the parametric fork mapping. Just note that for the moment, we have the on surface and inside volume options here, and we can often really make our scene kneel with the latter, and sometimes it will only be useful with the more powerful machines. Nevertheless, we will do our best to have some control over these options. This step size parameter will generally make the difference between whether we get it right or end up with a crash. All right, those are generally all the parameters. And also, this is where I will mention that we are getting into this territory of murdering your machine. So that when you use volumetrics, the render times will definitely be longer. Now, sometimes just a little bit, sometimes dramatically, and we'll try to learn when it's worth the time and when it pays to simplify it to make it calculate faster. But it will definitely be a bit longer in any case. So it is also a bit of going to another level. We have to be aware of more things, but if you take the time or invest in a machine, the impact is proportionally high. Generally, not that many people use it precisely because it often requires a powerful machine or because you don't often have time to test the parameters yourself. If you have a computer that is quite weak, it will take an eternity and you will just get frustrated with it especially if you are just beginning and some elements might seem counterintuitive to you. Anyway, we hope that so far so good, so let's move on because it's going to be a bit tricky here. We've got a solid dose of knowledge here, so we are going to try to use that somehow. Let's talk about something sexy and get onto the subject of god rays. And what are the god rays anyway? As the name itself suggests, some people used to compare them to God himself shining with some kind of the light source onto the air from behind the clouds. Of course, we know that is what is meant here is a situation where we have volumetrics limited to certain columns illuminated by light. And such columns of illuminated air will contrast with the rest of the environment, causing some light streaks. In fact, I will return to this interactive view. And in order for the god rays to generally work in the scene, well, a few things have to work. Firstly, we need to have a light source that is small enough and strong enough. And the sun is generally such a source. I mean, it's small enough and it's also as strong as you can get in the reality. We want our light source to be like a kind of torch and torches have this thing about them that it's a very pinpoint, focused and small light with a lot of intensity. And it will be the sun as we see it here. The second thing is that we need some objects to cast these shadows. They must have some prominent form that will stand out from their surroundings. And this will often be tree branches. And just remember that if we have a very homogeneous scene, this effect will not particularly stand out. Here we have seen, for example, these god rays appeared due to the character of the edge of the tree line. I mean, all those sprouting branches and gaps between them. And generally, this is enough for these god rays to start appearing somewhere here. Okay, and the third requirement is going to be about where in space our volumetrics are exactly how big a volumetric container we have. And I think this will be most and easiest to show if we shine a side light onto the scene. Because we remember that our volumetric container is global, infinite almost. If we insert the sun in such a scene with global volumetrics, it will be hard to see any god rays at all. Let's maybe try to disable this global volumetric and put in a local volumetric container instead. It will take some kind of a small box on which we will apply volume material. Of course, this box is smaller, 
So in order to compensate for this, absorption distance should be also smaller. Let's put it somewhere in here. And I think we can still reduce this a bit here. Let's maybe try to adjust the light direction somehow. Okay, and we are starting to see that there is something going on here. We already have some shadows here. And we can see that, for example, this shadow of the building is very pronounced inside the box. It's clearly a god ray, but it was enough that we had this fog in front of the building literally half a meter away and suddenly somewhere we lose that rendering potential. And that's because it sort of matters what is happening in front of the god ray. So as we had that box closer to the camera, then that god ray was there all the time, but in front of that god ray there was a fog where the light was scattered and completely kind of nullified the rendering potential of the effect. Like, for example, with a god ray like this, when we turn on this global fog here, all of a sudden we read that there's something going on here, but we can't see this god ray anymore. It's somewhere out there in this small contrast, but with this kind of highlight scattering, it gets lost. So often we are not able to find the god ray in the scene or produce them there because we just have a fog that somehow diffuses the light between these god rays and our camera. Maybe I will remove that box and I'll get to the point, which is that with such a global volumetric material, these bug scattered god rays come out in the best way. So we'll try to get the sun somewhere here so that it is visible in the frame. Here we can brighten it up. And it needs some tweaking until I find the right direction. Generally, this is because we are in the shadow of those objects that cast God rays. So now you may not see them too much. It's also already a matter of interactive that sometimes these little contrasts don't come out very well very quickly. Let's increase the directionality parameter and we should get them definitely more visible. Okay, we are already starting to see them. and the sun a little more to the left. So we can see here, for example, that this opulent shadow is cast by the chimney, and here they start from these trees. So it's simply because we, in the camera, 
are almost in the shadow of these objects and there is nothing going on within this space that would distort that clear visibility of god rays in any way. I mean, there is no other light and shadow dynamics that would change that readability. So, it looks cool. And now we are going to finish this scenario, finally. I think we will aim for the directionality set to 0 0.6. And here we have the final properties for the fog. We landed with 10,000 centimeters, mid gray with a slight color cast, directionality at 0 0.6. The rest is unchanged and the normal sun only that with an overridden temperature at 2500 Kelvin. So really very simple settings. We can also execute this scene with water visible in the foreground. I have a feeling it will be just more interesting. So we can switch to these high poly assets here. And here let's turn this lawn off and we can basically start rendering this. I would just add a volumetric render element here. This would be a good scenario to see what's going on here and how we can use it in post-production. And basically we don't need anything else. Now it can be rendered. Okay, we've got the final render and we can see that the god rays came out pretty cool and we've got this volumetrics element rendering here. We can see that it's just a pure volumetric pass from the scene. No direct, no reflect, no nothing. And we can see that this in general by itself is a super attractive image. We can often use this pass to add a volumetric impression, but in this case we will use it for the opposite purpose. We will use it to subtract some non-volumetric detail from our scene. That is, for example, if we have some elements in that foreground, like this lit bush, and it doesn't necessarily fit us compositionally, we can go through and just fade it out a little bit. Yes, we just reduce those elements to just plain volumetrics without the detail that got accumulated from other sources. And we've also already done a bit of a vignette organically. I'm going to further add curves for myself here and try to lower the midtones a little bit so that a little bit of contrast comes out here on this kind of key elements. On the other hand, we'll also rise the blacks a bit. This is the first scenario in which we want to rise the blacks somewhat artistically. I mean, we accept that we are losing a little bit of the detail somewhere here, but we have a feeling that in the end it might add to this effect, to the impression of the scene scorched by the sun and that's the direction we are looking for. And the last thing we'll do is to pour in some color. This time in a slightly different way. We will create a solid color layer and we are going to take this color maybe from here and we are going to pour it in as a soft light with an opacity somewhere at 20%. We can then see it pouring into these black areas that we've elevated before. What's more, we duplicate this layer and set it for a multiply blending mode, by which we lower the sky ranges a bit. And my impression now is that the image is way more stylized. This range is narrower, it's a bit more cinematic. It's got like a little bit of additional drama, this moody feel to it. And that's as much as we'd like to get out of it. If, for example, it bothered us that it's a bit too bright on these tones, we could always temper it a little bit more with this total volumetrics layer, yeah?
but I think it's okay now, so we can finish this scenario. Okay, I think we are slowly bringing this lesson home. We'll still give you a few pieces of advice on working with volumetrics itself. Know that volumetrics is such a beast that you have to feel it on your skin. You just have to jump into it and test it out. If you've never uh, tried it before, it may seem like magic, but it's really not. You'll understand it all if you start working with it. So anyway, a handful of tips. Just a couple of common mistakes to work with volumetric faster and better. So once again, we repeat it over and over again all the time, but composition is super important in any image, especially with volumetrics. If your scene is somehow cluttered, there are not some powerful silhouettes to show, then the volumetric effect just won't be that attractive. You need to have the difference of depth layers so they can cut off nicely. Another little scene with volumetrics is about realizing that you just have to add it in the first place. Earlier, we talked about aerial perspective and you really don't need to have a full foggy situation to start thinking about the volumetrics. They are often a complete must-have to introduce even in a very naturalistic and seemingly simple scenes. Do not compromise here. Another thing, another tip is already pretty technical. If you create a volumetric locally as a box, be careful not to insert a camera within it, then it simply won't work. You might also want to be careful about when to increase the directionality parameter and when also change the density of the volumetric itself. Because as we explored earlier, both will give different effects. Another tip, watch out for the interactive trap. As we are rendering in interactive, the details often look slightly different, so it's also generally worth having quick production tests to be able to evaluate volumetric effects properly. And as a final point, in general you can render scenes with strong volumetrics with a higher noise threshold than you usually do. It wouldn't do any harm to have that subtle noise, because that plays along with the artistic effect and a lot of people will buy that. We can also denoise it extensively in post-production. Various tools handle it quite well, so once again, it's advisable to turn it off a bit sooner. That would be it. We hope you'll use volumetrics on your next project and do something truly impressive. See you in the next lesson.